All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Minneapolis by Jerry Hall. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing great, John. How are you doing? Fantastic, fantastic. And Jerry is the author of this fascinating book, Downhills Don't Come Free, One Man's Bike Ride from Alaska to Mexico. Um, it's a three-time international award-winning um, bestseller. But I guess the, the, the crux of it to start with, Jerry, is that you'd expect this book to be written by somebody who was an avid cyclist and who one day thought, okay, you know, I love cycling so much, I'm going to cycle from Alaska to to Mexico, but you weren't really an avid cyclist. You didn't have a team around you. So explain the madness. What what made you decide to pick up a bike one day and cycle to Mexico? <laughs> well, it, it is a little bit foolish and it's an insane story, but I think that's the charm of the story as well, is that I was 57 at the time. Um, and I'd been in 33, 34 years of corporate um, sales and sales leadership at that point. And every transaction started feeling the same. It's like it, they took a lot of skills to execute because they were big ticket, uh, long sell cycle type deals. And but they all started feeling the same. And I said to myself, is this all there is? And then combined with that, I was um, I'd read every adventure book known to mankind. And I'd seen the pickles that women and men had gotten themselves into. And you always you can't help but you put yourself in the middle of it and say, what would I do? Mm -hmm. What would I do in a big adventure? And then point three is I wanted to see what I was made of. I wanted to see what would I do in some of these situations that become kind of strange uh, as happened in the book. And then the fourth is you think you fast forward and you're laying on your deathbed. And I was thinking, does one more day in the office, does one more sales transaction, one more deal. Does that make me more rich? Does it make me better? Does it make me more experienced? Does it make my life fuller? And the only conclusion is no. So I had to do something big. I wanted to do it quick. I wasn't a cyclist. I'd never, I didn't, I was a, you know, kind of just an around the neighborhood rider, never mm -hmm. had biking clothes, never ridden in clips. And um, I just, I said to my wife, I think I see, need something new. I think I need something big. And we're in pillow talk together. And she, and I tell her what I'm thinking. She turns her head sideways and she says, what are you waiting for? Go, mm -hmm. it's your turn. And I go, whoa, talk about <laughs> supportive. What a gift. Yeah. She says, look, you bought a house. We got married. We had three kids. We educated those kids. We launched those kids. You've done, you let me back away from my corporate career. You've done everything someone would want. Now it's your turn. Go do what you want to do. And I wasn't trying to find myself. I just wanted to see sure. what I was made of. It was just as simple as that. So those are kind of the, the, the driving forces and the impetus to do this and do something big. And I was, like I say, untrained, inexperienced, never mm -hmm. ridden distance at all. But I just thought, I think I can do this. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's that's um, that's that's fascinating. You're a great, great uh, story. In Ireland, by the way, they call them mammals. That's middle-aged men in lycra. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I'm there. You know what's so interesting, John, is that there's so many people that I would go to cocktail parties, and I'm talking to everybody. Like I said, I was 57 at the time, mm -hmm. and everybody I'm talking to is kind of late mid career or late career. And, and it felt like so many people were just plain tired of what they were doing. Yeah. Not be, and they still had to do it. They still had to make money. They still had to fund the family. They had to do it all. And I'm talking about men and women, but they're all looking for something bigger, but people don't take the jump. They don't take the mean, the mindful risk to change your life and mm -hmm. get growth and change. And I think you need growth and change to stay young, youthful, exuberant, and excited about the next thing. And that's what I did. I had to go. And I mean, it just really wasn't a choice. So what, um, let's say uh, in the first week or so you were doing it, because you have your book is laid out day by day, right? Um, and it took, uh, what is it, 51 days? Is that right? Yeah, I did it in 51 days, Alaska to Mexico. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the border of Mexico, at the, right south of San Diego, I tagged the border. I didn't go into Mexico. But right. the method is, you know, I didn't do this to write a book. I didn't do it to get mm-hmm. content. I didn't do it to become a keynote speaker, or a motivational speaker. I didn't do it to do any of that kind of stuff. I just wanted to see what I was made of. And I knew I'd get great stories. And I didn't know how I'd grow and change. I just knew I would. And so mm-hmm. the whole the whole thing is if you take a big leap and you pick a stretch, and then you make it bigger than you thought it was going to be um, and attack it, growth right. and change will happen by default. You don't have to go to a growth and change conference. You don't have to go do the ropes course down at the local uh, gym and all that kind of stuff. Take something big and attack it and go into the within the face of uncertainty and the unknown and let your let your judgment, let your skills, you get your rife with great skills. Just use mm-hmm. them and then change and grow as you go. Read and react, fast adaption, all that kind of stuff. That's what I did on the bike trip. And it worked marvelously. And along the way, um, I didn't want to write a blog. I didn't want to write a book. I didn't do this to write, but my daughter right. said to me, she said, Dad, you got to write a blog. And I said, I don't want to write a blog. She says, we got to know where you are. I said, you're not going to know where I am. I'm in the wilderness of Alaska. There's no cell towers up there. There's none Mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. And uh, she says, oh, shut up and just write the blog. And so (laughs) to accommodate her, I did. And um, as it turns out, I started getting a bunch of blog responses by people saying, dude, we don't know who you are. But these yeah. stories are, are incredible. You got to write the book. And so I still didn't think I was going to write a book. I didn't want to write anything. I'd, I'd never written, really written Jack in my life. Mm-hmm. When I got home, I was home for about three weeks or a month. And I was kind of been lacking purpose. And right, I thought, right. Well, maybe I should write the book. I mean, I, I got the stories now, but I have just like the bike trip itself going into the other I had no clue how to start a book. I had no clue how to write a book. But you just start, you think, you improve, you read and react, and lo and behold, I write the book, publish it, and uh, subsequently got three international book awards. It's, yeah. it, 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 I, it, I think anybody can do it. I think anybody can do it. That's the, that's the message. Don't, don't hold yourself back. Yeah, yeah. So what was maybe in the first week, what were some of the things that really surprised you about the journey and then about yourself? Well, in the first week, you, what you find out is um, you're more resilient than you thought, that you're going to adapt and grow and change. And the things that look big, hairy, and audacious, mm-hmm. and the goblins out there that are that you think are going to scare you, um, aren't as big a deal as you thought. Right. The other thing I learned pretty quickly was attitude was better than any equipment I had. It's just sort of like... I thought about it and I thought, do I want another day in the office or think of the ill, the injured, the disabled or the disadvantaged who would give anything that on my worst day, on my worst day, it's better than many of their best day. How Mm. can I complain about anything? Just grind yourself through it. But along the way, it doesn't mean it wasn't without risk. I ran into 20 bears. I had 20 bear encounters, two moose, uh-huh. and a near miss with a cougar. I was shouting at bears every day. I passed a mama grizzly and her two cubs within about 50 feet. And that's that's kind of a tense and tenuous moment. Mm-hmm. And that could have been a whole different story. I could have been an inkblot in the Alaska Daily News of another bite death of someone attacked by a grizzly. It didn't happen. But I went past it, but I was yelling at bears every day. I had hellacious <laughs> storms, monstrous uphills, uh, mountain pass after mountain pass, and hellacious headwinds. And you're battling all that stuff. But throughout, the magnificence of it overwhelms all the challenges. Mm. So just go. Go do your thing. Uh, uh, and I presume um, there were obviously, I presume there were times when you maybe you were tempted to 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 quit. I mean, it, it, when that when those ideas come into your head, how did you reorient your thinking? Well, I, I, go, I go back to the to the attitude that how fortunate am I to be out here? Mm-hmm. So even though I had very trying times, um, I I never once thought of turning back or quitting. Or, or hanging it up because 
what I started to realize is in the first week, I'm pounding out 75, 85, almost 100 miles every day. In the subsequent few weeks, I was pounding out hundreds and hundreds, 100 miles a day, 100 miles a day. And like I say, your body's resilient. All of a sudden, you start looking at a map, you say, my God, I'm progressing faster than I ever thought. Never thought I'd be here where I am at this time. And, um, and what you realize is that you can take those bites and take those chunks. And what I, what I learned is take what the day gives you. Some days gave me more and I mm-hmm. just rode with it. And some days give you much less. Just do your best on those days and don't worry about them because there's other days that are going to give you more and pour on the coal when you got days that are going to give you more and take advantage of them. So I never thought of turning back, but I'll tell you, I had never been in clips. I bought the bike within 30 days of resigning. I bought the bike, flew to Anchorage, and I was pedaling out 6th Avenue in Anchorage. I'd never clipped in my bike. I never packed it in Minneapolis. I never tested it, never tried it. I just eyeballed it all, and I said, I think this works. And so the first time I'd really ridden the loaded bike in clips and everything else, and I'd never had clips um, you know, in my neighborhood mm-hmm. bike riding, I was wobbling down 6th Avenue. This bike was about a hundred pounds. It felt like pedaling a cement truck. And, mm. and, uh, and I also was very unsteady because I didn't balance my load and I didn't know you needed to do that. So in the first three minutes of the journey, pedaling out of this ratty little hotel I was in, the first three minutes, I said, whoa, mm. no power is going to have to carry me because I don't have the talent and the training. And, um, and so it was the willpower and the attitude till I started figuring out how to use energy more efficiently, how to be the most efficient pedaling gear, how to do all that stuff and where I thought I could get most in preservation of energy, yet still pressing to get mm-hmm. someplace. And you learn all that stuff by default. I think in any challenge you take on, whether it's business, whether it's personal, uh, it's something that has always terrified you, but you wanted to try, you'll find that you can press through those things and you'll get better quicker than you ever thought. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And what I wanted to ask you as well is, um, so how do, when you talked about energy management, motivation and all of that, how did you do that? I mean, there are obviously times when you needed to recuperate or whatever. I mean, how did you make sure that you, that you, recuperated enough but not too much that you would start to you know atrophy or something but so how did you manage all of that i i just read my body um it was really pretty much energy management you found the natural rhythm you found a natural style my style would be different than anybody else's style my style would be different than a lance armstrong or any of the uh, you know the the historic cyclists Everybody's got their own. What, what I found out is everybody's got their own rhythm, their own style. In sales, everybody's got their own way of approaching customers as long as you have their interests at heart. And in peddling, what I found out is I found out when to press and when not to press. And I found out don't try and make time going uphill. It's an exorbitant waste of energy for the incremental speed you'll get. But I can actually pound out big miles on uh, the flats. And mm-hmm. enormous miles on the downhills when I wasn't battling a raging headwind because I had these headwinds that sometimes I'd come, I'd, I'd pedal for four or five hours going uphill, and then I'd have the downhill side of it going down to a valley, but the raging headwind was such I had to pedal the downhill, and that mm-hmm. wasn't fair. It just wasn't mm-hmm. fair, but it, it's what was dealt you, and you have to just deal with it, you know. Mm-hmm. In, in the end, what, what I looked at, John, is I, I gave myself a test. And I gave myself this test. It was called the big deal, little deal test. It was binary. And I said, what is a big deal and what is a little deal? And I thought, if I can get killed or maimed in the next moments, that's a big deal. Everything else is a little deal. Mm. Everything else is a little deal. And what you find out is all your challenges, your trials, your tribulations, your frustrations, they're all little deals. And the only big deals was I had to get by that mama grizzly. I had to shout at 20 bears along the way and that kind of stuff. Or if I had a big mountain crash, I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I'm barreling down uh, mountains at 50 to 55 miles an hour, just like a runaway freight train. Mm-hmm. And if, if my bike comes apart or if I crash or slip, 
I'm, I'm just a, I'm a demolition derby over the entire Alaska. It's a yard sale. And I, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's no medical attention, no medical help. So those are big deals to try and be at my best doing that. But everything else, all those other little trials that would be frustration to get people knocked off their game, they're little deals. Even a lost sale, yeah, nobody likes it. Nobody likes it. But then you just do kind of a review of what happened and why do you think it happened and what did you miss and all that kind of stuff. But in the sum total of life, it's a little deal. On your deathbed, yeah. you're not going to look back and say, God, I blew that sale. You're going to say, did I live a full, rich life? Did I do everything I could to really live as full as I could could do. And as you live fuller, there's more people that want to have conversations with you, that want to engage you. When you have meaningful conversations, you build trust. People want to do business with who they trust. Yeah, no, 100%. And I love that thing about the the, the big and small deals. Because sometimes you have to remind yourself when, you know, there's a lot of hectic stuff going on that, you know, that thankfully in most of our professions, like nobody dies. And when things are the worst, happens right. nobody dies right yeah um and and i think putting it into perspective and, and i like that today because i think um you know there's there's a loss of proportionality in what people get upset about today you know everything rises to the almost to the life or death situation today so i think part of it is we have to go back as you say to really kind of asking ourselves what are the big deals and what aren't and how do we define those in our life and in our work right Right. And, and think about it the other way. Everybody who's risen in an organization to the top or to the executive levels or even mid-management, they've all blown something. They've all mm -hmm. had a failure. And oh, yeah. the fact is, is those failures forge who you are and how you deal with that and how you pick yourself back up and persevere through. And I, I don't want to get into all the little stupid little sales platitudes about that, but what you got to realize is that everybody in any position of power has had massive failures, but they also see the good side on the backside and they figure out how to take the failure and the weakness of that. And what mm -hmm. I found for me, if you read the book, there's a massive failure at the end, but I'm not going to blow the story for you. <laughs> but I take that. And when I go to a cocktail party and I tell everybody about my grit and my perseverance and, you know, what I, how I drive through it and all that kind of stuff. Pretty soon I'm talking to myself. I'm alone. I'm talking to the wall. Everybody's left. <laughs> but when I talk about how I blew up and how I flamed out and how I made a, a, an enormous failure, they all come back in. They crack another beer and they want to get deeper about what happened. How did that happen? <laughs> how did you let that happen? And that's where the conversations occur. And that's where the meaningfulness and the trust and the actual relationship yeah. occurs and they want to know more and they want to do more business with you. And you say, here's what I do differently. Here's what I learned. Here's what I won't do to you because I learned how this blew this thing up. And that's so what yeah. you find out is how to turn your failure into a strength. Yeah, well, you know that old saying, a man who never made a mistake, never made anything. Right. So um, <laughs> there you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah, and I think, and I think coming back to a point, just a, a last one to talk about a point that you made a few minutes ago, is I think that you know, for people listening, you don't have to jump on a bike and you know cycle from Alaska to Mexico. You can if you want. Who am I to stop you? Um, yeah. But uh, if that's not your deal, sometimes, sometimes looking back at how far you've come and what you've overcome, because I think people are so much more resilient and capable than they often give themselves credit for, because they never look back. And never, never, you know, sometimes they look back in regret as opposed to looking back and saying, wow, I made it through that. Yeah, OK. And I made it through that. And look where I am today. So actually, I'm actually I'm a, not just a survivor. I'm a thriver. Yeah. Oh, I think if you knew going in what it was going to be, you might not do it. But once <laughs> yeah, you come true. through it. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are that way. When I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and they and they talk about the work of building their business from scratch over 10, 15, 20 years and how much work that was. And if they didn't know that burden going in, they would have never done it. But not one of them regrets it and says, oh, my God, I'm so glad I'm doing my thing. I'm independent. I'm creating happy customers and they life is good. And nobody would would. Uh, turn back and do something different than that. This trip was very much that same thing. You can't possibly know what the burdens are going in, 
but you work through them. And at the end, you look back and you say, oh, my God, that was magnificent. And then here's what's really funny. What looked big, hairy, audacious up front to me, like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to do this, but I'm going to. Now, to me, it doesn't feel like that big a deal. Right. So what that means is that your perspective is totally changed. And what happens is you expand beyond where it even makes little things and little problems that got in your way seem more inconsequential once you do big things that actually are made more meaningful. And to me, the meaningfulness isn't to anybody else about what I did on this bike ride. But if you, and I'm not trying to plug my book, but if you read the book, you'll find elements of things you're probably doing that you say, how do I get through that? And I think I can get through that. Yeah. And yeah, when you yeah, read yeah. the stories, all of a sudden you say, I can do more. I can do more than I ever thought I could do. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, fantastic, Jerry. So many great takeaways. Um, all of Jerry's information is going to be below this video. Below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Okay, so um, I, I have, my undergrad degree was an engineering degree. I have an MBA, both from the University of Minnesota. I went into the corporate life. I went into sales and sales leadership because I just love the idea of talking to the customers, solving their problems, that kind of stuff. Not that it doesn't have its own trials and tribulations, but as we said up front, when you when you finally figured out the game in a lot of ways, you said, okay, now it all feels the same. So I had to do something new and big that turned into a um, motivational speaker. And I have to admit to you, I never really liked a lot of motivational speakers because I thought it was all a lot of platitudes and a lot of inauthenticity. And now I've become one. And, but it's right. crazy because what you do is you tell authentic stories about what really happened and what your feelings were and what issues were facing you and what you did, either right or wrong. And people are engrossed by the actual authenticity of the story. Yes. And they're inspired yeah. that you can do so much more than you think. And you can do it quicker than you think. And you'll, and you'll come out the other side. You'll come yeah. out the other side. No, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Very uh, totally inspirational, Jerry. And I hope people check out the book. The book, again, is called Downhills Don't Come Free, One Man's Bike Ride from Alaska to Mexico. I would encourage people to check it out. It's a multi-award winning book and fascinating story. So thanks again, Jerry, for sharing it. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me, John, and to the audience, uh, best wishes for all your success. Thank you so much.